everyone. I'm Congressman Hank Johnson representing Georgia's 4th Congressional District, and I want to thank you all for being a part of the 50th anniversary year for the Congressional Black Caucus. As a people, we've come a long way over the last 50 years, but recent events have shown us that we still have a long way to go in establishing our rights to freedom, equality, and equity in this country that we built and that is ours. And that brings us to today's panel discussion entitled, Nothing Changes If Nothing Changes, No More Lip Service. Today's panel will discuss the topic of equity in the business of music, the contributions of black people to the American culture through music are well known and recognized, yet underappreciated, undervalued, and undercompensated. Our music has kept our spirits high for the centuries that we've labored as slaves and as we were treated as second-class citizens. And up from slavery for 402 years until today, our music has been enjoyed by all Americans and our country and our culture has been emulated, adopted, and mimicked by others as it contributed to the culture of America. Gospel, blues, country, rock and roll, rhythm and blues, jazz, rap, hip hop, black music, whatever the genre, black people have been at the forefront, creating and carrying the torch that others have taken and monetized for their benefit and at the detriment of the creators and facilitators. The subject of equity and fairness in the music business is an uncomfortable subject for many, but today's panel entitled, Nothing Changes if Nothing, if Nothing Changes, No More Lip Service, gives us an opportunity to talk about how we can leverage the power of black artists, producers, writers, publishers, executives, to gain more influence within an industry that has systemically marginalized and devalued black talent, primarily by paying us pennies and then looking us in the face and giving us the old, the same old lip service. I, today, um, today we address how blacks in the music business suffer from the systemic racism that exists within every aspect of the business, from artists, managers, and producers fighting for fair contracts and fair royalties, to the paucity of black executives at labels, and even the lack of black people in digital streaming. Today's panel will put some truths out in the open as we talk about today's reality in the music business and proclaim no more lip service. I'm grateful to the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation for hosting this panel as part of our annual legislative conference. And I wanna thank our esteemed panel for joining us today. Now I want to introduce our moderator for today. You've seen her on the Today Show MSN, CNN, iHeartRadio, and the list goes on. She is the executive director of R&B and hip hop for Billboard magazine, the one and only Ms. Gail Mitchell. I appreciate you being here and it's all yours, Gail, thank you. All right, thank you, Congressman Johnson, especially for hosting such an important session as this one will be. And welcome to all the viewers who are tuning in right now. Before we get into the subject at hand, nothing changes if nothing changes, no more lip service. I'd really like to uh, introduce our esteemed panelists for today's chat. Uh, first up, Benta Nyambi Brown, co-founder and co-chair of the Black Music Action Coalition. She's also head of operations and strategy at Keep Cool slash RCA Records and founder of Oma Lily Projects, an artist management and production company. Willie Prophet's Diet Stiggers, 
is co-founder and co-chair also of the Black Music Action Coalition and CEO of 5050 Music Group Management, a management consultant and publishing company. Ray Daniels is vice president of ANR at Warner Music and CEO of his own conglomerate, Radar Entertainment. Dina Lapote Esquire is the founder and owner of Lapote Law PC and one of the uh, key principles behind the passage of the Modern, Mu Modern Music Modernization Act, of the Music Modernization Act, I'm sorry, Bill, I'm sorry, uh, signed into law in uh, 2018, very important. It uh, led the way to uh, bringing about a blanket licensing system for digital music providers and addressing payments to the creators of the music that we all enjoy. And last and certainly not least is Joshua J. Wynn Rayford, Director of Hip Hop at Pandora and Program Director for Sirius XM Pandora Now. He also launched Uninterrupted Radio on Pandora, on Pandora in partnership with LeBron James and, the Maver and Maverick Carter. So to get things started, I wanna start with both Benta and Profit to talk about, uh, to lay the groundwork, set the tone for today's conversation in that it's been a year since the day of racial reckoning that the, uh, that the uh, industry went through last June too, uh, when, the, when the show must be paused, uh, set up a day of, of silence and reflection to address the issue of the systemic bias that's become, uh, uh, that's been uh, such an issue for many years within the music industry. So I wanted to start with Benta and Profit first. The Black Music Action Coalition also came into being that same month, a few days after the Day of Reckoning. Uh, a coalition of managers, agents, and other allies within the music industry to also help address the issue of systemic bias and push forward the steps towards sustainable, actionable and sustainable change. Uh, this year, this June, marking the anniversary, first year anniversary of June 2, Day of Reckoning, the BMAC issued the Music Industry Report Card, their first annual report card, assessing the progress made over the last year. So we'll start with Benta. I wanted you and, and Profit first, Benta, to talk about uh, just what you found and in the report card. What grade, what overall grade did you give the industry and what does still need to be changed? What were the glaring things that you still haven't seen after a year has passed? Hi, good morning. Um, thanks, Gil. So I mean, I, in terms of the overall grade for the industry, I, it, it's average uh, um, and, and honestly, in many cases, below average. Um, and I want to be really clear about something. There are some people who, in looking at our grading and our grading system, have said, um, oh, you know, this is better than we thought it would be. And, and, and to that, I really have two comments and observations. Um, the first is that when it comes to equality and equity, uh, we have to have a perfect score. If we're getting average, if we're getting Cs, then that means that there's injustice that's still occurring. Uh, and so it's not a, a particularly positive statement on the state of the industry when it comes to achieving equity. Uh, the second is, is that uh, for, for many of us, particularly those of us who grew up in black households, uh, we knew better than to ever bring home uh, an average grade. Uh, you know, my father, I, I think this, this became popular on Scandal several years ago, but my father was very famous for telling me that I was expected to do 200%. Uh, and, uh, and it's been a driving force. And so when people say, ah, this is good, you know, we got a C, or we got a B minus uh, in a category or a section, uh, to that I say, I, I, I would have been sent back to the library and, and asked why I didn't do better. Um, and so I, I think that we have uh, an, an opportunity uh, to do much better than we've been doing. Um, and I, I, what we don't want is for people to look at the grades and to say, oh, it's not as bad as we thought it would be overall. Uh, and so, so we're good. And then leave this conversation alone. What we want for folks to do is to look at the grades and to understand that you know, again, when it comes to equity, when it comes to humanity, when it comes to dignity and equality, um, anything short of an A plus is not acceptable. Uh, first and foremost, uh, thank you, Benta, for that. I, I want to thank the congressman 
and the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation for hosting us. Uh, thank you, Gail, for moderating and for your many years of journalism and, and really helping to paint the picture of the culture in a way that, that, that only you could. So, so thank you for moderating. And, and to your question, I, I think that first and foremost, what we found were not things that, that were not available to the public, right? There, there, was, there was nothing we discovered that, 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 that we didn't already know. Uh, we wanted to first hold people accountable to their commitments, first and foremost, to the topic of this panel conversation, the lip service. Um, we've been served that conversation before as a people. And so for us, we want to make sure that an industry that we live in, that we believe in, that we believe have the opportunity to transform this country and this nation, this world, uh, first live up to, to, to the commitments that they made. And so we graded them on that. And, and I will say, I mean, look, uh, what we will say is I appreciate the fact that task force were developed uh, in the major labels across the systems. So for the first time you had black people at the table voicing concerns and, and really being in the position to actually uh, forge, force change uh, in their buildings. So we, we're, not gonna, we, we're not gonna act like that wasn't an accomplishment. I, I, want, I wanna applaud that. And I wanna applaud those people on the task force. You know, it was, it was during a pandemic and, 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 and a lot was going on and you had black people, people uh, who, who, who are, you know, subject matter experts, you know, best in class uh, coming together over time, uh, late at night, trying to figure out how to solve racism you know, stuff that they, that they didn't even start. So, you know, I, I first want to commend the work of those task force members and say that we were very impressed with what they have done. Um, but overall, we wanted to put the, the music industry on notice that uh, blanket statements and false promises um, won't work here and that you can actually live up to your, to your, to your commitments and BMAC will help you do that. Okay, Ray, Ray Daniels, uh, you're there on the major label side, listening to uh, both Benta and Profit. What are you seeing, uh, what have you seen and experienced over the last year in terms of sustainable change or steps towards making sure sustainable change starts to happen? Uh, first of all, Benta, you're a gangster. Me and Profit have been friends for a long time, but I just love gangsters and you're a gangster, so I say that. Um, what I would say is, is that I think the intent is there, but it's hard to tell. So I have, I have, I have unique ways of looking at things. Obviously that's why I'm here. So I look at things a little different, right? When you say equity, to me, that means ownership, right? To me, that means giving someone ownership is they're trying to find a way to give us a voice that they can still listen to but it doesn't give us the power to necessarily do the things that need to be done. Um, you know, I still should, you know, I still would say that there's only uh, one, there's only two people who I can think of Sylvia Rohn and big John Platt who actually can cut a check without asking someone non-black for permission. You know, uh, our genre is the biggest genre and, you know, we're still, we still have to have permission from people who are not in our culture to engage our culture. So I want to say that I think that I, I think they intend as well, but I think the hard part of it is just realizing giving up equity means getting out the chair and letting someone else sit there. And I think what they're trying to do is bring more chairs to the table while they sit at the big while they sit at the big seat. So it's like, come on, sit here and tell me what I need to do. And the reality is what you need to do is get out that chair and give it to me or give it to someone that looks like me because this is my culture. Uh, Profit can relate to this, and I know he can. When things go bad in our business, it, it puts our lives in danger. It's not just our, our freedom. Like when, if stuff goes bad, like I'm signing guys from the streets who are looking at me almost like a uncle, father, coach figure in their life. I can't treat them like business. I have to treat them like humans. And I'm not allowed to treat them like humans because I'm basically following the rules that the business sets in front of me. So for me, I feel like every day I wake up and do this, I'm putting my life in danger because either I'm gonna do it, either I'm gonna be honest to my culture 
or I'm going to be loyal to a system that's not loyal to me in a lot of ways. So for me, I just, for me, it's like, I, I, I understand the intent, but the, the, the true thing you have to do is get out the seat. Like if, if I'm a man, if women are discussing women rights, I don't wanna be in that room. Tell me how it should go because I'm not a woman and I can talk about the experience of being a woman. Tell me how you want it to go and I'm going to follow you. I, and I want the same, I want the same thing for my people. I want to, if I'm gonna tell a kid, I want to sign you and I'm in charge, that kid is looking to me. They, I've sat with fathers, mothers who said, take care of my son. And I've actually said, my famous saying to anybody who I work with is, I'm not gonna tell your son to do anything I wouldn't tell my son to do. I'm not gonna tell your daughter to do anything that I'm not gonna tell my daughter to do. You know, so for me, there's a responsibility that I have, but it's like I'm responsible for the house, but it's the lease ain't in my name, nothing's in my name, and I could be told at any given moment to get the hell out. And that's really the hard part of being black in the music business. I'm just being honest, like my my I don't my name ain't on nothing. So I can't, it's hard for me to act like I have ownership, but everybody looks to me when something goes wrong. Nobody blames white people when go, stuff goes wrong. They gonna talk about me. Ray is a sellout and you know that profit. And I don't wanna be considered that. I wanna be, I, I, and I feel like there's a way for us all to win with transparency. And if you are hiding something, that means you're the one that's up to something. And I could be transparent with my people cause I can tell them I came from that and I'm here now and I can show you how to get here. You can't. That's why you should get out the seat and give it to someone that looks like me. And that's just really how I feel. Okay, you thank know, you. Yeah, go ahead, Dina. Yeah, you know, let me weigh in. Ray, I love you to death. And I wanna bring everybody's attention to the fact that Ray wrote this article a year ago called Dear White Music Executive. And as his lawyer, he was very stressed out about putting it out and he actually put it out anonymously. Um, and it resonated with every black music artist and executive in the music industry. And it's still a problem. And I love Sylvia Rohn to death and I love Big John Platt, but here's the bottom line, okay? Until there's a black person at the head of these global music companies, we're not going to see anything change, okay? Unfortunately, that's it. You know, we have white people telling black people what to do in their own culture, and it's a problem. And I've been very vocal about it. And, you know, Binta, I appreciate, you know, the, and I'm on the lead, executive leadership committee of BMAC, proud member. Um, and I appreciate the race report card and how it came out. However, I would have given the music industry an F. I was one of those people that called Profit and Binta and said, F. Where's the F? But, you know, I get that we have to make changes. You get more with honey than you do with vinegar. Um, but I wanted to weigh on, on this issue. All right. And, and this one last thing I want to say, I just, I just, because I came up with this yesterday, because I was talking about this yesterday. In order to be successful in Black in the music industry, we have to be Superman. In order to be successful in White in this music industry, you can just be Clark Kent. And that's the reality. We got to fly. We got to do everything perfect. We got to be 200% to get half. And they can just be Clark Kent show with a suit on and look like the hero and get all of the damn stuff. And that's very, 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 very frustrating. Incredible. Yeah, I just want to add in for uh, uh, in, uh, one example of change that happened in March was Ethiopia had to marry him being promoted uh, to chairman CEO at Motown Records, which is now a standalone label after 20 years. So that is one step in the right direction. Certainly, as Dina said, there's a lot more. And as everyone else has said, too, there's a lot more further we have inroads we need to make before uh, it, it's there's equity and as Prophet brought up uh, uh, ownership and Ray as well. So Jay, Jay one, one thing I want to bring to your yes. attention, she still reports to Lucien Grange. Okay? okay. So she's the chairwoman of Motown and I love Lucien Grange. He's a great right. friend and a great executive, but he's a white man. So sure. it would be great to have someone black in the head of Sony global, the head of Warner's global, the head of universal yep. global, because in the music business, it's the labels that are the ones that put up all the risk money. And they're the ones that are, are signing and putting up the money for the marketing and the promotion of the records. And there's where the change has to come. And, and it's something very important to add, Gail. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, like I said, Ethiopia, who bought you, gave me a check that changed my life. Right. 
had to be Superman. Yeah, and, true. But they and Jeff Vaughn was we got the bigger, bigger job, and he was just Clark Kent. And Jeff Vaughn is a great friend of mine. I love him to death. He's actually one of the really great, brilliant minds. But he got the job over her to be her boss before she even got the CEO gig herself. That's the problem because it's just that's just the biggest problem with it. Sorry, Agreed. I just had to say that. No. I, I know we got to get J1 in, but yes. if I, if I, I'm going to put on my former corporate Wall Street hat, um, you know, the, the Ethiopia and Jeff thing is really interesting to me because somebody asked me, they said, you know, well, how does this happen? And I said, well, don't you understand that this was their succession planning? So this was, it, it wasn't, none of it, you know, like Jeff's appointment, Ethiopia, like those weren't reactionary things. Like it was planned, you know, like Jeff was brought into capital and then he was elevated into, into his current role. Um, and so, you know, the people who are doing the planning and who are doing the thinking, uh, who have the discretion, have a responsibility um, to think even more carefully, you know, like they, they should be thinking about the Ethiopias out there, the Rays out there, the Prophets, the J1s, the Bintas, they should be thinking about us and including us in the, the, the possibility of their succession planning. Um, and just one other little very brief comment, uh, and that's that we're talking about black music uh, and black executives, but, but therein lies one of the other lies, right? Which is that black people can only speak to black culture and to black music, or what is perceived to be black music. Uh, and, and that's simply not true. Uh, you know, not, not, and, and, it's, and it's not true for a couple of different reasons. It's not true in part because black people are the creators of rock, we're the creators of blues, we're the creators of, of so many different genres, but it's also not true from, um, from, from, a more, from a broader perspective, which is that, you know, being black and having brown skin and black features doesn't mean that we're only, like, that the only culture that we are uh, of and about is that which looks exactly like us, right? You know, many of us have a variety of different life experiences, a variety of different influences. If you're a good marketer, you should be able to market almost anything. If you're a good attorney, you should be able to represent your counsel, or I'm sorry, represent your, your, your clients, you know, regardless of, 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 of what they look like. You know, if you're a good, you know, operations person, good manager, all of these different things, these are skill sets. And a skill set isn't attached to a particular race or a particular culture. It's, it's attached to our humanity and to our overall human development. And so, you know, now that there are some people who are beginning to think more favorably, sort of, and to make additional strides, we also need to make some even even greater strides, which is to say that it's not going to be equity, and I'm using the fairness definition of equity, it's not equitable um, if we're not actually integrated. And we're not integrated if we're only, and if we're not integrated if, if we're only seen and, 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 and showing up in spaces that are seen as being black spaces. In fact, that's the very opposite of equity from my perspective. You know, that, that is the, the definition of, of inequity and of ghettoizing and saying, well, the black people are going to be over here doing the black people's stuff um, and owning the black people's stuff. But we're not we're still not really part of society. You know, we're still not really part of the fabric of of where we live. And as a result of that, you know, we're carrying a, an, an, an enormous burden. Um, and it's a burden that's related to exclusion. Um, so I just wanted to, to get those couple of thoughts in there real quick. And um, I know we got to get to this. And then we got to get to J1. My <laughs> brother J1, uh, which is an incredible brother who, I, who I've known for a while, who I've watched grow in his business and his industry, who moves with, 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 with unmatched levels of integrity. Um, and, and I'm very happy for all the success he has. But I want to say one thing before bringing him on, that up until this point, they hadn't needed to make those changes, right? Because it was Ray in the room talking. It was Dina over here talking. It was Bencha over there talking. But what our goal is, is for these voices to come together collectively and use the collective bargaining power of artists 
and of the brain power of the black executives to force this change. So we're not even asking about this. This is something that we, that we are gonna be very meticulous about and very strategic about how we're moving. But these are not things we're asking about. We are putting people on notice that these changes need to happen if there's gonna to continue to be an industry that involves black people. Uh, J1. All right. Yeah, J1, please weigh in. Uh, is, are you seeing the parallel, this, para this happening uh, on parallel with what uh, at radio, at the streaming side of things? these issues as well? Uh, I mean, definitely. It's a, it's a problem within the music industry, just overall, whether you're looking at the labels, the streaming platforms, there definitely needs to be a call for more Black executives, more Black people in the C-suite level, and more Black people on the board of executives, because that's where a lot of the decisions are being made. Those are the ones who are deciding who the CEO is going to be and what the budgets look like and what's approved. So, you know, it, it's, it's a conversation that we're having within our company that, that's happening in the music business at large. Um, you know, uh, Prophet, you my brother, I, I have nothing but respect for Benta and Ray Daniels. I've known you for a long time. So it's up to all of us to just hold these companies accountable. I know within uh, Sirius XM and Pandora, myself and, and brother Sway Calloway, we put together like our own task force within the company to talk about these issues and stuff like that. And, you know, we, we still have ways to go, but I do give credit where credit's due. The company is, has done a good job as far as making strides to try to diversify and, and, and bring in more inclusion. One of the, 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 uh, the programs that I'm particularly proud of, because I graduated from Morehouse College, we created a program called the Pathways Program, which employs recent HBCU graduates. Me coming up in Morehouse, I never had that opportunity. There were no music companies or streaming companies or radio companies coming to the college, but now we're actively like recruiting those, those students. Um, and one of the people who report to me, I told her like, look, like to Benta's credit, don't just learn about hip hop and R&B. You need to learn about country music. You need to learn about pop music. You need to learn about rock and roll and stuff because again, it's no problem with somebody that doesn't look like us being over all these genres, but you don't see a lot of us being over all these genres. So um, again, it, 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 it's, it's up to us to come together and, and hold these companies accountable. Um, again, I think SiriusXM and Pandora ha have gone, done a, job, a good job as far as listening to us and making the necessary steps for change but we still got ways to go like everybody else in the music industry. All right, I, I have a question I wanna throw out to everyone and who wants to answer first and follow up is, is fine, but I would love to know just what reaction are you getting? Last June, it was, we're gonna change, blah, 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 we're right behind you, we're in with you, we're working with you. And then when June 2 rolled around this time, to me, there was a lot of silence going on and I don't hear anything from too many of the companies, uh, you know, granted they started the task forces as, as you all said earlier, et cetera. But what really is the uh, reaction? Are, are they for this? Is it just lip service? Is there some earnestness in the music industry about making sustainable change? No. I, I, <laughs> like it's, it's crazy to me because they don't, if, if it was up to, like I said, we're only talking about these things because a man got murdered by the police in cold blood. Like I always say, it, it seems like it takes something bad to happen for them to want to talk about it because talking about it means it, it, change has to come. And I don't believe no one really wants change because change means diversifying power. And I don't think no one wants to diversify power because who the hell wants to give power up? So do I, I do are they are they trying to are they creating more pro programs for like okay we're going to create a program for the kids at the HBCUs or we or the kids here and, and I'm being honest with you that's that's amazing by the way but I've been here 16 years in line and I've been and I got plaques on my wall from everybody from from uh NLE Chopper to to uh What's the country? Um, I guess it's, it's, it's at the back of my head. He's married to Nicole Kidman. It's literally, I just had it in my head. Oh, Keith Urban. I got, I got, I got plaques from everywhere. I've been, I've participated in every genre. I've done everything. And I feel like it's almost like 
I, saw, I feel like they treat us like the starter wives. Like, okay, you guys are here. <laughs> we'll get it right next time. No, 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 no. Get it right now. Get it right now. We built this also, and we want to be treated with equity. So for me, I think that, I think 20 years from now, it's going to be probably way different. But I think right now it's, a, it, it's, it's, it's quiet. It's like, oh, well, hopefully no one else dies at the hands of the police on camera, so we don't have to talk about this again. But, but, but you know, I, I, would, I would say this to, to Ray's point, two things. One, the music business is a reflection of society. So it's as quiet in the music business as it is on the streets, right? So, you know, what's going on in America? You know, where is the urgency? Do we still have that same urgency that we had last year? Right. We understood that this would be the place that we would be at next year, which is why we started BMAC to ensure that when the doors quieted down, when folks went back into their homes and felt that things were safe, that we were right there in your face and say, no, nah, we're going to hold you accountable. You can't tell me Black Lives Matter and not prove it. Not this go round, not on our watch. I mean, look, uh, it, 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 um, the music industry is a reflection of America. America is a reflection of the music industry. We, we, we know what the trends have been in terms of the kind of legislation uh, that's been pursued uh, over the course of the last four or five months, uh, especially. Uh, you know, I, we're not blind to the, 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 the goals of states, state houses around the country to erase uh, uh, black history. And it's black history. It's not just critical race theory. I mean, let's, let's be honest about what it is. Um, it is the, the pain and suffering of black people uh, in the United States of America uh, since before slavery. To not talk about that. Why? Because it's inconvenient and it makes people feel badly. Um, you know, to not, to, to not want to have fairness uh, in, a, in, a, in a democracy. You know, we're supposed to be the example to the entire world. This isn't a political issue. This is fundamental uh, to, 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 to the establishment of the United States of America and, 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 and the form of government we have you know, for the people, by the people. It's just, which people? Which people are we actually, uh, you know, uh, willing to bring to the table? And so when we think about it from the perspective of the music industry, I mean, these are very powerful people. It would be, and there's so many qualified, you know, and, and, you know, people who've been waiting in line, people who haven't been waiting in line, people who, like, give their all to what they do every single day. It, it is not hard to make the decision to make somebody a CEO <laughs> or to make somebody a president, uh, to, make some, to, 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 to give somebody budgetary discretion. It is not hard to hire people. Everybody who's on this panel, we hire and fire, but we hire people all of the time. You know? And some of, the, some of the people we hire, it works out and it's great. And some of the people we hire, it doesn't work out, but at least we, we we are giving people the opportunity to show themselves and what they can do. So, you know, I, it, it's, it's interesting to me, you know, like it, we, some people say, oh, well, we just got distracted. But the reality is that a lot of people just got, they said, well, we talked about it. You know, can we move on to the next thing now? And, and then, and, and, and never, ever, and this is a repeating pattern, uh, not just in the music industry, but throughout society of not wanting to talk about the things we need to fix and not wanting to talk about them from a place of, of truth and authenticity and integrity um, and, and learning how to have these conversations. We run repeatedly from the difficult conversations. And as a result of running from those difficult conversations, because it makes us feel weird inside, we don't change anything. We wait for it to go away, and then another horrible thing happens. You know, like, like one black man necessarily hasn't been killed in the same way that George Floyd was killed last summer, but the, the, the violence in American cities right now is astounding. You know, and, 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 and it's, it, it's all of this stuff is just going to continue so long as we are afraid of making the kinds of decisions we need to make. And we're not going to make those decisions in the absence of having a real conversation about them. And, and let me just say one thing. In terms of those hard conversations, there are a couple of companies. Uh, J1's company is, is one of them. It should be applauded because after we put out the report card, you know, we, we, we've always been very open and we've been very deliberate in our language of 
come and speak with us. We want to work with you to create this change. We can do this together. And when we create these changes, we're going to create more value for everybody. You know, so to Ray's point about folks not wanting to, uh, to, to diversify because it means that they're going to have to compete and they might lose. Well, here's the thing. When we have a, a fair competition and, and, the, and the playing field is fair, there is derivative value that's and, and true competition, not the perverted form of competition that, that we adhere to in the United States, where it's zero sum, where it means that if you have the position, then I don't. But in a true competition, you know, it's a, it's a collaborative dance where we're engaging in, you know, like iron sharp, iron sharp sharpens iron. You know, like you make me better, you make me better. I mean, we're in the middle, midst of the Olympics right now, right? So like each athlete is out there, they're on the field trying to do their best. The consequence of everybody doing their best is all of this derivative, derivative value and benefit for, for, for the rest of society, for the rest of sport. And so when you have that, what you're actually doing is you're increasing the pie. And when you're making the pie bigger, everybody who's a participant in that system, unless there's inequality, um, everybody who's a, a participant in a system where there's equality, where there's equity, everyone is growing wealthier. Everyone is doing better. Everyone is is prospering. It doesn't have to be this idea of, you know, profit got the job, so that means that I didn't get the job and now I'm a loser, I'm a failure. No, profit got the job and you contributed to something in the process of profit getting the job and now you go and you build a business, you know, somewhere else that is going to compete against profit's business and keep engaging in that collaborative dance. So, you know, Pandora came to us, uh, you know, one of the big agencies, CAA, Sony, we've had some conversations, but most of these companies have not reached out to us, even though we've had our arms wide open. They haven't come and said, how can we work with you to improve? What can we do? And we're looking, you know, if, if there was a time, you know, when I was growing up where my grade was just a little bit lower than what my father would have wanted to see, I went to those teachers and I said, help me understand what I need to do to improve in this class. Help me understand what I need to do. And then I went home and I did the work. That's all we're looking for the music industry to do is to have sufficient humility to say, we still have a problem. We're not running away from this problem. We're going to work with people and we're going to do we're, we're going to keep doing the work because if we don't do the work, the consequence, the end result is, you know, permanent inequity, permanent instability in our system. Because as long as there is one of us who doesn't have uh, the truth of our human dignity, as long, as long as there's somebody who isn't able to fully express themselves, fully express their humanity, as long as there's any form of discrimination, whether it is direct or indirect, intended or unintended, as long as we have that, our system is not stable. Our system is in jeopardy. And I don't know why any of us are willing to tolerate an unstable system. J1, I want you to address uh, what Benda was talking about with, with Pandora and your outreach. But before that, Dina, you're in and out of a lot of executive suites at the labels, at all levels, the labels, legislative, all over. I just wanted to get your temperature gauge as well, to the know, climate out there for change. It's interesting because, you know, here it's a bigger, it's a whole country issue. Like, mm -hmm. like Prophet says, I mean, 12 generations of slavery, 100 years of separate but not equal, which we all know is not equal. And here we are, there's still 1700 Confederate monuments up in this country. This is pathetic. You know, I mean, just look at if you have a, a swastika in Germany, it's a it's a felony, you get arrested and you go to prison for up to three years. I mean, that's we need to enact things like this in the country. When I was reading Cast by Isabel Wilkerson, I was very disturbed by the whole thing. Um, just, you know, basically that what we said, nothing changes and nothing changes. And I feel like this is a movement that is that's got to keep we got to keep the pressure on the movement, not just in the music industry, but across all, you know, all areas in business and you know for me like when i'm representing um my artists i'm very 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 cognitive of the differences in what they get paid as opposed to what our artists get paid there's some very there's some 
systemic racism in the music industry that must change. For example, using the word master recording, that has to end. You know, master recording is a, is a racist term that was developed in the 60s and the 70s by labels when, uh, you know, the chairman of the record company or whatever wanted a copy of the, of the recording, would call the engineer in the studio when everything was analog and say, make me a slave recording. That's what they did. So, you know, I'm on a mission to change the word master recording in every single record and producer agreement that is coming out in America. The other thing, the mixtape. The mixtape, okay, this is only used Absolutely. against Black artists. So you don't see Taylor Swift giving a mixtape, okay? What is a mixtape? A mixtape is an album, okay? And, 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 and to Dina's point, and, and I'm happy this is such a hot topic for me, it is... It is, I mean, the most upfront, in your face piece of racism that you can look at. And mix I'll explain and it. Culture, mixtapes and our culture, it came from hip hop culture. It was you rapping over someone else's music and giving it out for free. It was That's for promo use only. This is what it was. These labels now are making you put out two and three and four mixtapes before you get to your album one. Because at that point, they don't, they don't have to recoup, commit, by the way. They, Sorry to interrupt. They don't have to commit the album budgets. But what they do is they put out the and, hope, and hope that you catch one. Bodak Yellow came off of a second mixtape released from, from, uh, from, from Cardi. You know, it is it, 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 only in hip hop, only in rap is, does this exist. Why? Free and it has to go. It's just another uh, 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 songs given away free. That have nothing to do with you uh, towards uh, recouping or towards uh, uh, your, 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 your album commitments. It's insane. Wait, 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 let me, let me explain. Let me, hold on. Let me, okay. let me explain the legal ramifications of this. Okay. So in a recording agreement, the artist is obligated to deliver a certain amount of recordings and albums to the label. In California, it can't be more than seven albums because that's the law. That's the seven-year rule. They have a, a, a law like that also in New York and some other states. But basically speaking, you know, albums are usually, you know, record deals are usually, you know, five to seven records. And in, and in record deals for Black artists, you will very much see five albums plus three mixtapes or seven albums plus three mixtapes and you do not see this in any deals with white artists the other thing too with executives and i'm going to say it i represent a lot of executives in the music business and i am very vocal i will literally say you're the head of hr i'll say really this is what you're paying her because at this company over here the white man they're paying this and I will say this, and sometimes I get calls, really angry calls from heads of lawyers, chairman of the labels telling me, you know, not everything is a racist issue or a gender issue. And I go, actually, everything is a racist and issue and a gender issue. When is the last time you like flew into Memphis, Tennessee, got off the airport and took a look at the, you know, Confederate monument when you're like, you know, walking around like, you know, so we just have to say it. And I'll tell you the other thing I want to say. Here's the, the bottom line. With all this critical race theory, like we should be learning about all this stuff. Okay, the Tulsa Race Massacre, Juneteenth, all of this stuff. And thank God I had parents that taught us this when we grew up in a very progressive town, right? Named after Sojourner Truth. So, but I'm not the regular white person. Okay, and I'm going to tell you something really honestly. Only white people are uncomfortable talking about race. Okay. They're the ones that are uncomfortable talking about race. But guess what? Wake up. It's time to talk about race. This is the time to talk about race. God bless Dina LaPone. Yes, God bless God Dina bless indeed. Dina I mean, she you great. talk about a warrior lawyer. Listen, and for, for people who, who are not familiar with Dina, get very familiar with her. I mean, she is incredible. I mean, not just as it relates to race, and ensuring that black artists are treated fairly and the black executives get treated fairly, but she's fighting for artists. You know, she's out there changing laws to help benefit artists. I mean, this is incredible, incredible, incredible work. Thank God for Dean Lippo. All right, before we, uh, time is, is getting close here, but I wanna talk to J1. It's been to mention that Pandora was one of the few companies that made an outreach after the release of the uh, BMAX uh, report card. So just what else is Pandora doing, J1, in, in terms of leading this charge towards sustainable change? 
Well, first and foremost, I, I want to thank Profit and, and, and Venta for like creating BMAC and holding uh, these companies accountable. I, I think that's part of the solution right there. Um, we talked about it's a year later. What is the conversation? Well, it's 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 organizations like BMAC and 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 what Dina is doing to keep these conversations going, and, and we have to continue to hold. Uh, the music industry accountable. That's the only way change is going to be made. Uh, so, you know, when we first saw it, like when I first saw it, I was like, oh, wow, okay, what, what, what's going on here? So, you know, I, I, I shot it up to whoever I needed to sh uh, shoot it up to. When I saw that report card, it was like, what are we doing here? Because like, we, we've been trying to make some moves, but look at this grade. So, you know, uh, shout out to our, 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 our DNI person, Nicole. She, uh, she got on it right away. She yeah. investigated. Um, you know, we found out like, you know, the person that was sent to, he's no longer an employee there. And then Nicole communicated, made sure she got in contact with Profit and Bitta and just talked about some of the stuff that we've been doing. I mentioned the Pathways program. You know, the company actually has dedicated $25 million towards racial equality, education and different organizations. And the cool part is I actually sit on that committee to decide where the funds are actually going. So I can keep an eye and make sure that it's not lip service and, and, and things like that. Uh, we've also launched a program for Sonic Diversity, trying to advocate for more black voices in media and advertisement, because that's a big problem in itself. You'll hear all these black radio stations, but then there are white voices doing the advertisement. So um, I give credit to Sirius XM and Pandora and Stitcher for that. So again, you know, they're making strides do we have an A yet? Absolutely not. There's still more that we can do. And I've been a big advocate of this. I, I, I feel like we need more Black executives, VP level, C-suite, and on the board of executives, not just within my company, but across the board. And that's the way things are going to change. That's how decisions are going to be different. And that's how the hiring practices are going to be different as well. So it may not, you know, it's, a, it's an ongoing fight. It may not change like within our generation, but we got to fight for the young college students that look up to us that are coming up behind us that are the future CEOs that can be on that board of executives who are actually taking music business classes, something that I never had the opportunity to get when I was in college. But these kids are learning about the business and understanding contracts coming straight out of college and they're hungry for it. So if, if not for us, you know, I feel I feel you right. You know, we, we've been standing online, but sometimes we don't make it to the promised land and we're trying to do it for the next generation. I'm hoping change comes faster than that. But if not, we just got to keep fighting. And the letter that I wrote and that I wrote that I wrote, the, that I wrote, I I literally said I want to be there. Yeah. Like, see, see, that's the thing. I didn't educate you because I want you to look past me. I just educated you because you asked the question. Right. So I I I. My thing is, is this, I say systematic racism exists and here's why. If I see a black kid from stealing, trying to steal my car and I find out he's from College Park, I'm automatically going to have a different feeling towards that black kid because he's from where I'm from. He came from where I know where he coming from. I know what he's feeling. And because I was once that black kid and I can relate to it, right? The reality is, is that we shouldn't have to create programs for the young kids coming up if people like you or myself in power, there's no need for programs because we're going to we're going to uh, uh, create opportunities for people that look like us because we have a responsibility to us. So that's the, that's what I'm saying. Fuck a program. Put the right people in power and watch things change. You want to see change? Put the right people in power. I didn't feel like this is. I'm being honest with you. As a black man, I never felt like I belonged here or I could take my shoes off and be comfortable here until Barack Obama won. That was the first one I felt like. We really are Americans, like honestly. So for me, it's like, we need more of those moments of not just men, not just black people, but women right. also. Yeah. We need, we, this is not about race. This is just about, this is not even attack on white men. It's like, dog, you did your part, but you're asking us, how do we, how do we look out for y'all? Give me, put me in a power position to look out for mine because I will. Put me in a position to create jobs for mine because I will. Because that's the only reason why we're here at this point. We're here to create opportunities for everyone that looks like us. So yeah. you don't have to do that. Without question. No, 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 and, 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 I, and I would say this to Jay one at this. We can end racism. Mm -hmm. Racism isn't a disease, right? We, we, you know, this isn't something that 
we need to get around, scientists need to come around like it was, you know, COVID and figure out a vaccination for the. It's a decision of people choosing to treat people fairly, right? That, that, that can happen. America's 250th birthday is 2026. Our goal, my goal is for this country to finally grow up by its 250th birthday. We can end racism, and we should, and we should, and we should be bold enough to say that. No, I, no, no. Listen, I have a 24 year old, and I have a one year old. You know, that's 24 years of me out here calling for justice. No, I, I need to absolutely be here for this. You know, I, I just don't need to happen no other time but right now. And we all need to make a collective decision that we're not taking anything else as an option in our lifetime right now. Force I, these people to do this and do it now. I totally agree. And I'm on, on board with both of y'all. You know, I feel like like exactly what you said, right? You know, say we definitely need to be in these positions now. But all I am saying, I am saying this, you know, if we can't force their hands, we still got to keep fighting. We still got to keep training, training the next generation and inspiring them. Like, Yes, I was inspired just like you. Like, I felt the same way when Barack Obama got elected. But look what happened right after that. You know what I'm saying? We have to keep on fighting and, keep on, keep, <laughs> and, and, and stay, stay vigilant and, and, and diligent on this stuff. So even if it doesn't happen with us, we're still training up those next leaders, regardless if we're in that position or not. So, yes, I'm with you, bro, because, like, I want to be in that suite now. <laughs> All right, we're, we're down. I'm sorry, bitch. Uh, yeah, we're down to the last five minutes oh. or even less at this point. Um, so realistically, as we fight the fight to turn talk into action real quick from each of you and Benta, you can add whatever point you were trying to make. I'm, I'm sorry for interrupting you. But where do you want to see things this time next year? What do you want to see have happened? when we get together, because I'd love to do this again next year. So let's start with J1 and we'll work our way across the panel. Um, well, this is an awesome panel. Uh, I've been blessed and humbled to like know you guys and, and, and just discuss these issues. We need more of this. Um, I mean, next year, we, we, we just need, we need change. You know, I mean, like Ray said, and like Venta said, there are companies that are making strides or creating programs, but it, it, we need that equity at the end of the day. I mean, we need to be in those, those leadership positions. We need to be on the board of executives, the, C, the C-suite, uh, the executive suite, and so on. Um, that's what I really want to see because you know money has been distributed and that's great. Um, programs have been established and that's great, but the other piece is the equity piece, the leadership piece. So that's what I want to see see next year. And God forbid it doesn't happen next year. We we just gonna keep fighting. It's you know, it's not something that I plan on stopping the conversation or or or, or getting frustrated with. We just gotta keep fighting. All right, Dina, Sony or Universal or Warner's Global needs to have a black person running it. So that has to happen within the next couple of years. There should be an initiative for that to happen. Um, the other thing that has to happen is $424 million in unallocated mechanical royalty income was paid over to the MLC board that was created under the Music Modernization Act, was paid over from the streaming services. A lot of that money is to rap and hip hop artists. So we have to make sure that they're getting their money. All these black artists are getting their money. A lot of the song splits are not negotiated and we have to make sure that they're at the table getting their money and that the publishers don't get it and then just pass it through to market share. And what happens is if a lot of people of, of color will be less, left out of the equation. And I think that we all have to continue to speak up about race. White people don't like talking about race. So talk about race, bring it up because it's always there. Y'all know, cause you're black. It's always in the room. So you know what, when I'm around, I'll bring it up for you. All right, real quick. We're down to the last two minutes. Binta. I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna try to bring us home. Um, <laughs> so uh, four years from now, I wanna see every company across the industry 
uh, with, with straight A's. And I want to see them continuing to get straight A's year after year after year. Uh, in order to get there, that means that next year there has to be an increase from where we were this year. Uh, we need more transparency. We need more folks to participate in the surveys uh, because the grades are only as good as the information that's available to us. Uh, we need people to come with it and to be willing to make the changes that need to be made. Uh, so I, I want to see a gradual increase in grades, but four years from now, or actually, yeah, four years from now, I want to see everybody with straight A's. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm just going to close with, with one final thought, which is that, um, you know, I, like Prophet, I think that racism, I think it can be ended. And, and I don't think that it's rocket science. Uh, it does require some people to give up something they're holding on to. It requires giving up fear. It requires a willingness to listen, uh, to not take things personally. Uh, and mostly, uh, whether you are somebody who has suffered the consequences of racism or whether you have perpetuated racism uh, through action or inaction, um, it mostly it requires love. It re requires a spirit and an atmosphere of true and genuine and complete love, loving our neighbors. And so I, I believe that we can get there. I refuse. I can't. There's no purpose to our existence if things have to stay the way they are. And I refuse to accept that it has to be this way. I believe that we can be a society that's rooted in love. I believe that we can be a society that's rooted in hope. And I think that when we all allow for that transformation to occur in us, that we're going to get there. Okay, well, we'll end on that note as I'm saying time is up. Thank you to all the esteemed panelists. I enjoyed this conversation. I hope people have listened and are learning and helping to join in the fight for sustainable change. It has to happen. It must happen and it will happen. And thank you again to Congressman Johnson and the Congressional Black Caucus for uh, giving us this forum and just well, this thank you. chat. I'm so, I'm so, I'm ready to fight the fight with you some more. So here we go. And I want to thank all of my panelists, Dina Lepote, Benta Nyambi Brown, Prophet, Ray Daniels, and J1. I must extend a tremendous thank you to our moderator, Ms. Gail Mitchell, for doing a great job. And last but not least, I want to thank our audience for joining us today for our session entitled Nothing Changes If Nothing Changes, No More Lip Service. This has been an important discussion where we addressed long-standing racial inequities in our industry that we have a tremendous influence over and we feel that our seat at the table should reflect that influence. So thank you for joining us. We'll be back next year with another installment of the Black Music Action Coalition. Thank you and look forward to seeing you next year live and in living color. Thank you.